Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV. And in this series of short shows, we are examining some of the myths that perpetuate about the war. To discuss the Battle of the Atlantic is historian Alan Allport, author of Brown Dwarf and Bloody Minded and Britain at Bay, holding up my copy here, uh, which are linked in the description below. But without further ado, I'll bring Alan in. Good afternoon, Alan. How are you today? Hey, Woody. How are you? Very good. Thank you. I'm drinking my coffee today, so I don't cool. have tea, which unfortunately... So we're going to go straight into it because there's no time for chitter chat on these ones. You're going to present the case that it, the Battle of Atlantic was not quite the close run uh, thing it was. Um, right. So, folks, we will maybe have time for a couple of your comments at the end. But basically, I'm going to hand over to Alan to kind of explore this and I will jump in with a few comments. But there we go. The Battle of Atlantic was a close run thing. Myth. All right. OK, let's get going. Then. So I'm told that I have no time to, to waste here. So Battle of the Atlantic, uh, just as a definition, of course, this is the um, campaign that takes place from the first day of the war to the last day of the war, six years, um, predominantly, of course, in the Atlantic. But the name is a little bit misleading, of course, because it also takes place in the Mediterranean, in the Arctic, in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific and so on. But predominantly, most most of the, the critical theater is is the Atlantic. Um, it is a battle in which uh, the Allies seek to preserve uh, their maritime lines of communication and supply, and the Axis, predominantly the Germans, attempt to break those lines. Um, it is well. Maybe we'll just move, well, let's move on to the next, the, the first slide here. So, a couple of things. Let, let me let me explain what I'm not trying to say here. First of all, I am not trying to say. That the Battle of the Atlantic, first of all, was un unimportant. It was in it was extremely important. All of the Allies' ability both to build up the um, materiel and manpower that they needed to win the war would need to be conducted predominantly by sea. Uh, all power projection would need to take place by sea. Um, so breaking these lines of communication supply would have been absolutely disastrous to the Allied war effort. I'm also not trying to suggest that this was never a problem for the Allies. What I'm what I'm going to do here is distinguish a problem from a crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the best way of describing this is that the analogy that I, that I think is most useful is to think about the difference between diabetes and a heart attack. Mm -hmm. um, you have a heart attack, you can die within the next 15 minutes. You can die within the next hour. It is a touch and go thing. You don't exactly know what's going to happen. Um, some events during the Second World War could be described in those terms as being complete touch and go uh, things in which anything could potentially have happened. I don't think the Battle of the Atlantic is like that. I think the Battle of the Atlantic is like diabetes. It is a it is a problem. So, you know, if you get diabetes. That is, you know, that is serious. That is something that needs to be taken seriously. Uh, if you ignore it, then it eventually it could kill you in, in, in theory. On the other hand, however, it is manageable. Uh, it, you know what you need to do in order to be able to kind of respond to the problem. There are, there are, there's not, there's no, nothing mystery about it or anything like that. And if you do the things that you are supposed to do, then you can manage this problem. And the Battle of the Atlantic is the same kind of problem for the Allies. It is a problem throughout the whole war. But it is manageable. They know what they need to do. And as long as they do it, and as long as they don't do anything incredibly stupid, um, they will win this battle. Um, the Germans never really have a plausible theory of victory. The Germans, it's not, it's not as though if only the Germans had done this, which is what you, you get this so often in historically. Mm. If only the Germans had built more submarines, or if only the Germans had been able to, you know, maintain you know signal security or something like that, then who knows what would have happened. That is not really the case. And I will say now, yes, because this is always played as the sort of trump card. Yes, I know what Churchill said in his memoirs about the about that. We will come to that if at the end, if if time permits. Okay. All right. Next, next one. All right. So uh, it is very important to understand the Battle of the Atlantic to put aside the idea of um, big convoy battles with so-called wolf packs of massed U-boats attacking together. These things happened, of course. These were certainly things that happened during the Battle of the Atlantic, but they are not at the center of the Battle of the Atlantic. In some ways, they are somewhat peripheral to the, to the Battle of the Atlantic. Throughout the entire war, the single best way in which the Germans could sink Allied shipping tonnage was to attack Allied ships that were sailing what was called independently. In other words, they were not in convoy 
They were not with any other escorts. Either they had set out independently or they had become detached from a convoy or they were so-called, um, you know, that they, had, they were stragglers that they had inadvertently kind of lost to the rest of the convoy. The, re the reason for this is very straightforward. Convoys are a very bad target. J Dernitz and the U-boat crews know this right from the very beginning. You get a very, very bad return on investment in attacking convoys. Yes, there are one or two occasions, spectacular occasions, in which Wolfpack attacks on convoys produce very bad casualties. There's the famous SC-7 convoy in the, fall, the autumn of 1940. Uh, there's a convoy called SC-107, uh, which is in uh, November 1942, which gets, gets savaged. These are by far the exception to the rule. Um, the vast majority of convoys uh, get through with very light losses or no losses whatsoever. Uh, it's very hard to attack a convoy. It, it is very hard to attack a group of ships which are escorted. Even if the escort is weak, even if the escort is not very well equipped, even if it is the escort is not very well trained, escorts are able to break up attacks very effectively. The thing you really, really, really want to do is to be able to attack ships which, which are unescorted and which are traveling alone. Um, and it is not coincidental that the two periods in which the Germans do best in the Battle of the Atlantic are the two periods in which they can do this more than any other times. The first is for about a year after the fall of France from June 1940 to June 1941. And I've, I've tried to keep the stats as few as possible in this, but this is just one, one, of, one or two of my few stats here. So during that period, about, about two thirds of the ships that are sunk are sunk sailing independently. Um, the other period, even more spectacularly, is February to July 1942. This is the worst period. In terms of tonnage lost, this is the worst period uh, of the whole war for the Allies. Uh, and an extraordinary 89% of the ships that are sunk during that period are sunk traveling independently, not sunk mm. convoys. Even though it's the worst period of the war, no, the North Atlantic convoys are almost entirely untouched during that period. Um, so one thing to note here is that these were temporary situations. They were, they, were, they were unusual situations which were caused because there was, in particular, there was a shortage, there was a shortage or a, or a, dis, a decision not to use escorted convoys. After the fall of France for about a year, of course, the Royal Navy is preoccupied with having to deal with anti-invasion measures, which means that it can't spur the escorts to be able to produce to, to convoy ships. So an awful lot of ships have to be sent independently. They are easy targets for the Germans. But by June 1941, that problem is going away. And then for other reasons, too, I won't get into um, it, it means that there just aren't as many independently sailing ships. The period from February to July 1942, this is the, the so-called Operation Paukenschlag drumbeat period. This is the period where almost all of the losses during that period are in the Western Hemisphere, uh, along the American seaboard, basically from Boston to Trinidad. And this is this is just after the United States has entered the war and, the, and, the, and has not yet set up uh, a, an effective convoy or escort. Uh, screen. So all of these ships, particularly oil tankers, which are sailing from uh, Trinidad and Venezuela and the Gulf of Mexico and heading up the eastern seaboard to the big cities in the in you know New York and Philly and, and Boston, what have you, they are easy easy targets for independently tr uh, acting U-boats. But again, the Allies get this get their act together by the summer of 1942. They start to escort these vessels. After that period. Dun so this the, the next year or so, Dornitz concentrates on the North Atlantic convoys. But it's really important to remember, he doesn't do this because he wants to. He does this because he has no choice. Mm. Uh, they are not a good a target. They are, they are very, very tough. They produce a very, very bad return on investment. But he has no choice at this point. And so... Um, in some ways, there's a, there's a you know it's it's suggested that this is kind of the crisis moment because you have these famous mass attacks on the convoys, but in fact they're actually it's actually not nearly as successful as those previous periods where they've been able to attack independent ships. All right, so point three, lots of stats that could be thrown at this, but I've just thrown one set here. Even at what is considered the crisis moment in the battle, March 1943, which is often described in the in the histories as being the kind of make or break yep. moment, the Allies still have more merchant tonnage available than they had started the war with. Uh, so very quickly then, at the beginning of the war, 
The, the Allied nations have about 20 million uh, uh, gross registered tons of shipping, almost all of which are, are British registered. Now, during um, the next couple of years, um, they lose 18 and a half million tons. So almost all of that initial starting point. However, they also gain because of uh, things like the, the fleets of the, you know, the emigre nations like Norway and Greece and so on. They gain 8 million gross registered tons and they gain 13 and a half million new shipbuilding gross registered tons most of which is provided by the United States, uh, which is finally getting its shipbuilding industry into gear in the, uh, the end of 1941 into 1942. So by March 1943, they have more tonnage available than they had had at the start of the war. Now, a couple of just a couple of things to say here. One is that at no stage of the battle um, do the Allies have less tonnage than they had started mm. the war with. Uh, they always have that minimum amount. Um, the other thing is, you'll notice that how much of that new tonnage is American. Um, by 1943, the British specifically are running into a, 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 a shipbuilding, a, sh a, sh a ship tonnage problem, because most of the losses that have taken place are British registered ships. Now, that is not an allied problem, because the US has more than provided enough, enough ships to compensate for that. It is, however, a British political problem. Because it means that an awful lot of this Allied shipping is not actually controlled directly from London. Now it's controlled from Washington. So, the, so Churchill and the War Cabinet have increasing problems in being able to decide what to do with all of these ships. However, again, that's not a military problem. That's a political problem. Yeah. And that's that that has that's that's to do with the relationship between London and Washington. And so on. In terms of the Germans winning the war, it's irrelevant. You know, Allied shipping is Allied shipping, whether it's British registered, American registered, whatever. So, okay, let's keep moving. Right now, this might seem contradictory. So let me explain what I'm saying here. While on the one hand, I'm saying that the Allies always had enough ships. I'm also saying that the Allies were always short of shipping. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Why, why am I? The point here is to do with, remember when you were at school or when your mum and dad always told you about the difference between wants and needs? Okay, you know, I, I, you know, I, I need, uh, you know, this toy. Okay, you don't need it. You, you know, you might want it, but you don't need it. Okay. In the same way, there are Allied wants and needs. There are things that they absolutely have to do in order to be able to not lose the war. And there are things that they would like to do, that they would want to do, but aren't necessarily, but don't absolutely have to do. There are so, in terms of what you do with shipping, there are things that you absolutely must do. You absolutely must send enough food and raw materials to the United Kingdom, for instance, in order to be able to continue running its war economy and feeding its people. And otherwise, the nation will collapse. But there's an awful lot of things in addition to that that you would like to do with shipping, um, because especially from the end of 1942, where you're starting to gain the initiative in the war. And so you can start to do, you can start to conduct defensives. You can start to do, you know, new imaginative things. And this is the problem that the Allies have. For they, they're always short of shipping because there's always lots of things that they would like to do with, with, with ships. And they never have enough to be able to do what, everything that they would like to do. By the time you get to the winter of 1942-43, so around about the time of the Casablanca conference, you've got, of course, Operation Torch, a massive suck on shipping, but mm. partly because it, it goes on much foot longer than anybody had expected. You know, the campaign was supposed to only last a couple of weeks. It ends up going into mid-May of 1943. You've got simultaneously on the other side of the world, you've got this massive campaign in the Solomon Islands, uh, which, which soaks up a vast amount of Allied shipping as well. You've got the so-called Bolero buildup of American forces in the UK, which has been going on ever since the Pearl Harbor in order to try and eventually conduct a, an invasion of, um, of, of the France. You've got, as I say, UK raw, raw materials. You also have needs for other, other parts of the Allied world, in particular the Indian Ocean, which becomes a crisis after the Japanese invasion of Southeast Asia uh, and Burma. And, and one of the things that they have to do at the Casablanca conference is basically figure out what are the things we absolutely have to do with the sh our shipping and what are the things 
that we would like to do and what are the things that are going to have to get the short straw because we just don't have enough ships to be able to do everything that we would potentially could potentially do in this case Bolero is one of the things that that loses out so the allied build up in in the united kingdom is slower than they had originally anticipated this is one of the many reasons why there is no uh, second front in 1943 why the Allies don't invade in 1943, because they just don't have enough ships to be able to conduct torch and do this at the same time as well. The other thing that gets the short uh, straw more tragically is the Indian Ocean. Uh, Churchill basically makes a rule and says, we are cutting down all of the shipping that we're going to send east of the Cape of Good Hope. If we, we could get into a whole other story here about the Indian famine, the Bengal famine of 1943, this is a contributory factor to the to the the the, the mass uh, food shortages that take place in the Indian Ocean in 1943. Okay, let's keep moving. All right, this is just a, a quick aside. One of the kind of, oh, what ifs about all of this is, well, what if the Allies had not had Ultra? What if they had not had this critical ability to be able to read German signals? Surely that would have meant that the Germans would have won, won the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, again, we could do a whole hour on this. Um, the very short version is, is Ultra useful? Yes. Uh, does it save lives? Yes. Um, is it a deciding factor in the outcome of the Battle of the Atlantic? No. Okay. Even if the Allies had never been able to read a single Ultra signal, they almost certainly would have won the Battle of the Atlantic anyway. Might have taken a bit longer, might have been a bit more costly, but they would have done it. One of the reasons for this is, as I've explained there, Ultra is useful for some things and not, not useful for other things. It's very useful for, be, for being able to detour convoys. So in the second half of 1941, for instance, one of the things they do very effectively is they know where wolf packs are assembling in the North Atlantic. They're able to send the convoys around a different route to be able to avoid contact with, with the enemy. It's not much use in being able to prevent losses of independently sailing ships. Uh, and that, as I mentioned earlier, is mm. the key to the Battle of the Atlantic. So... The fact is that, you know, the, the Allies lose the ability to read German U-boat signals throughout most of 1942. But the point is, is that during most of 1942, this is the Paukenschlag period. This is the period when the, most of the ships that they're losing are sailing independently. So even if they had been able to read those signals, it probably wouldn't have made much difference because that's it's a different problem that, that, is, that, is, that is happening. Uh, very, very quickly, um, things which don't get anything like the kind of uh, uh, notice that Ultra does, be probably because they're kind of less sexy, because they don't have Benedict Cumberpatch kind of, you know, involved, is, you know, the things that mattered, better port logistics and maritime repair. This is one of, you know, a crucial thing, being able to unload um, cargoes mo more efficiently in like the West, the Western um, British ports like the Clyde and the Mersey and the and the Avon and so on. Faster repair times for ships which have been damaged at sea. Uh, tighter sailing regulations, so new kind of rules about when you when who has to be convoyed and who doesn't. More escorts, of course, both in uh, on the surface and in the air. Um, centimetric radar, uh, absolutely crucial, uh, for especially from 1943 onwards. Uh, high frequency direction finding and so on and so on. Again. I could go on at great length, but I won't. All right. So last one, last point. Okay, then. What about the big guy? Okay, what about Churchill? This is the this is the thing. Every time that you know you you raise a, a, a something about the Battle of the Atlantic and you say, well, it wasn't as close as people suggest, they say, aha, but Churchill said in second volume of his war memoirs, the quote. The only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. And it sort of slapped down as this, like, well, get out of that one kind of thing. Well, a couple of things about this statement. This is this is what I sometimes call the, 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 the historiographical curse of the well-known Churchill quote, okay? It says a lot, but it also says it's also deeply misleading as well. Churchill's memoirs were written in after the war when both, actually, at this, most of them when he was out of office. Um, he is writing in order to defend his wartime record. He is also writing in order to make political points and to score points. One of the things that he wanted to do in 1949 was to score points against the Labour government, which he was criticising for not spending enough money on naval uh, rearmament in the light of the Cold War that was just starting to develop creation of NATO. So he is he is having a bit of a jab at the Labour government here. Don't you realise just how important, you know, 
uh, the, the naval naval campaigns are. Um, if you read the quote in its full context, he is referring specifically to a relatively brief period in 1940 and 41, and he basically says shortly after this, after we after June. 1941, we had pretty much got it resolved. We, we, were, we, were, we were fine. Yeah, the Americans lose a load of ships in 1942, but that's their problem, not ours, essentially. Lastly, if you actually look during the war itself, Churchill has surprisingly little to say about the Battle of the Atlantic, apart from there's one, one or two short periods where he's sort of concerned about it. But most of the war, he is actually pretty confident about the way that it is going on. So, for instance, if you look at the correspondence between him and Franklin Roosevelt, during the so-called crisis period of the Battle of the Atlantic, which ought to be kind of preoccupying the, the, you know, the attentions of the American president and the British prime minister, they actually don't have much to say about it. You know, they're, they're, they, they're aware that it's going on, they're aware that it is a problem, but they're also fairly confident that they can get through it, that, you know, that it's not actually going to prove to be any kind of existential crisis. Okay, how do I do? That's not bad, is it? There you go. Not bad at all. No, we, we did it. I mean, we'll just make a couple of comments before we bring things to an end, because um, people are asking questions, even though we're not going to have time to answer them. But the idea of it, you know, the, the perception, we talked about it with the Battle of Britain myth, you know, show we did a year or so ago. And Rick Green is saying maybe in 1940, February 1941, the Allies weren't thinking of this as being temporary. And that that's the thing. At the time, if you were a merchant mariner on one of these convoys, you know, you don't have the data you presented. You don't have the the, no. the overall the overview that they're able to present us. So, you know, the perception at the time was that it was getting a close run thing, but we can now evaluate and say that it it, it wasn't. And and Peter O'Connell is reminding us that, of course, it may not have been uh, you know the the deciding fact, but we were still losing cargoes. We were still losing lives. Well, let me just say, let me very quickly, let me say something about that because it, it, sometimes when this comes up, you tend to get people, furious people that will come to you and say, "My grandfather spent you know three three days sitting on a on a you know a life raft in the middle of the uh, the Atlantic covered in oil." You know, how dare you besmirch his memory by by saying this kind of thing? My own grandfather, for what it's worth, was on a ship that was torpedoed in April 1942 and spent five days and nights in a in a lifeboat. So I get it. I I, I, I do get the point. It is no, in no way is it a criticism of those who who, yeah, who, exactly. who sacrificed in the campaign to say that their professionalism and courage meant that they were. It was very very unlikely that the sacrifices were ever going to be in vain. If, if anybody is to be criticized in this, it is Admiral Dernitz, who kept on sending U-boat crews to their deaths long after it was obvious that the, the battle was a forlorn hope, that there was no chance that they were, they were going to win this. So again, it is not in no way is it, a, is, is it any, you know, any kind of disrespect to say that the, you know, the Allied merchant mariners and the Allied seamen who took part in this, they did their job. They did exactly what was expected of them. They showed exceptional professionalism and courage. And as a result of that, it meant that the battle's outcome was more or less guaranteed all the way through. That, that's that's an important point to stress. Well, brilliant. We'll leave it at there. And people are asking lots of questions. They're posing lots of alternative thoughts. And they're asking about them. But we can discuss that. Anyway. We've done what we're supposed to do. Alan, it's been a fantastic pleasure talking to you. Um, folks, I'm back again in about seven minutes with Luke Truxell talking about the bad bomb group in Yates Air Force. But right now, I will let you all go and have a cup of tea. Um, and Alan, thanks very much. We will reconvene again at some point in the future. Uh, good luck for the rest of the season with Liverpool. And um, we will see each other again. Cheers, everybody. See you in a few minutes. Bye. Bye.